Well, welcome everyone. This is Brenda Haas, and I work here as a clinical manager at Reliant Behavioral Health and EAP. And we're going to be talking today about our topic, Exercise Your Health. A couple of details uh, before we get started. Uh, I want to remind you that a copy of the PowerPoint um, will be sent out to all of you that are participating. And also, there will be a link to the recorded webinar on our YouTube channel. So if you want to share it with anyone else or review it, um, if there's any aspect that you miss along the way, that will be available to you. Uh, we're not going to have any polling questions this time, as we uh, often and sometimes do, but there will be some moments along the way when I'm just going to pose a question to you and give you a moment to contemplate and, and consider uh, what your reaction to that might be. I'm going to be saving about five to seven minutes at the end for uh, any questions or comments. Um, and then, of course, if there are any other additional questions uh, after we end, feel free to email those in and, and we'll respond right back to you. So a couple of things um, uh, and a couple of quotes that I want to uh, share with you as we um, move through this. One of them is um, Robert Fulgham, for all my good intentions, there are days when things go wrong or I fall into old habits. When things are not going well, when I'm grumpy or mad, I'll realize that I've not been paying attention to my soul and I've not been following my best routine. Can anybody relate to that one? And then another one as we kind of move into our topic here um, from Brother Alfred D'Souza. For a long time, it had seemed to me that life was about to begin, real life, but there was always some obstacle in the way something to be got through first, some unfinished business, time still to be served, a debt to be paid, then life would begin. At last it dawned on me that these obstacles were my life. So as you think about your life and as you think about this topic of exercising your health and what that means to you, or as you think about wanting to make some changes for yourselves, not just because we've moved into a new year, but because sometimes this provides an opportunity moving into a new year. For me, oftentimes the fall, September, um, and then in January, and then sometimes again in spring, kind of a, during the solstice and the equinox, those be, are times of kind of reflection. So we, we're here at that time now. So for you, as you think about this, um, what are some obstacles that prevent you from making healthy choices or making some of the um, choices that you might like to make? Or if you're noticing that there's a disconnect between what you say you would like um, and how you would like your life to be and then what's showing up in your life. So just take a minute. Um, if you have paper and pencil, maybe jot down one or two things. First thing that comes to mind um, and, and just kind of take that a minute to see what that is for you. Kind of a moment to just reflect and contemplate. And actually, that's really a big part of what exercising our health is all about is it's taking time out to tune in, to hear that inner voice, that wise guide, that knowingness inside ourselves. Because the truth of it is really is that we are all our own best guide and we are all our own best resource. Sometimes we just forget to stop or we get consumed with the busyness of life and we don't take that time out to stop, tune in and pay attention. So you're attending today is just a great opportunity to to practice that. So thanks for taking care of you and being here with us together on this journey. Let's talk about what this journey today is going to be all about. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the dimensions of health. What is whole person health? What does that look like? Um, how are we going to activate a plan toward exercising our health? How are we going to be proactive about it? We're going to talk about sort of that disconnect or sometimes the, the polar opposites of control versus no control. 
when do we have control, when do we not have control, and then identify some next steps for moving forward with how to maybe implement um, a next step for yourself uh, moving through this. So um, let me make sure I'm moving my slides along so you can see them as I'm talking. So when we talk about whole person health, really we're talking about a number of different dimensions. And that includes kind of our self in the middle. That's sort of our uh, tuning into to ourself, who we are, and then um, looking at um, all these other dimensions. So we've got our um, physical health. That's our physical health and well-being. That's how our physical body is doing. That's attending to our physical body. Um, when the physical body is under a lot of stress, we're not tuning in, we're not paying attention, it's going to send us messages. That might be things like migraine headaches, tension headaches, high cholesterol, irritable bowel. Um, it could be um, uh, any kind of muscular tension, tightness in the neck, the low back, um, shoulders, all those things let us know, alert, alert, pay attention. So that's the physical dimension. Our mental and emotional, mental is our focus, it's our concentration, it's um, I'm driving down the freeway and I miss my exit and then realize, oh my gosh, I've missed my exit. So where was my focus and attention then? Uh, emotional is our emotional well-being. It's things like how we're feeling. Are we feeling joyful? Are we feeling happy? Are we feeling loving? Or are we feeling depressed or anxious or angry? You know, what do we notice uh, showing up for ourselves as we tune in and, and pay attention? Uh, social is is our relationship. It's our connections. It's connections with other people. Uh, and spiritual is that dimension that helps us connect with something greater than ourselves. And that's different for different people depending on your own particular persuasion and um, your belief systems. For some people, that might be God. For other people, it might be Buddha or Allah. It may be nature. It's spiritual is however you define that for yourself. And then another dimension of this that's not outlined here would be the behavioral, is how are we behaving in response to all of these kinds of things? Do our actions and behaviors um, kind of match um, what it is that we truly value most? Um, and for some people, behaviors may show up as mismanaging or misuse of drugs or alcohol or shopping or gambling, eating, under eating. Sometimes those can be indications that behaviorally we're um, coping or responding in those ways um, that start out maybe as a coping mechanism, but over time they no longer serve us because we become kind of uh, wound on the neck because we're not able to kind of be released from the grip of what's going on. So that's kind of what whole person health uh, looks like. And um, Stephen Covey, um, many of you maybe have heard of him. He's, he's kind of most noted for um, uh, his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And actually, he's actually written quite a, quite a number of books, but The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is one of his first books. It's been around and, and embraced in a lot of different arenas. And one of the things that he says um, about these four dimensions of health is he calls it sharpening the saw. Sharpening the saw is about constantly renewing ourselves in the four basic areas of our life, physical, social, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And it's that habit that increases our capacity to live all of our other habits um, of effectiveness. Basically, he's listed the... Um, the seven habits as the first three are about kind of self-mastery. One, be proactive. Uh, two, begin with the end in mind. Three, put first things first. And then the next three um, of his habits are kind of really more about interdependence. Um, think win-win. That's when we're not just looking at what's going to work for us, but what's going to work for, for others or the other, because the more we can work with win-win, then the more we're going to eliminate conflict and sometimes it's that strength in numbers. The more people can work together, we're, we're more gathered is what I often say. Sometimes magic happens. I know that's certainly true for me. Sometimes when I'm working together with somebody on a project, I feel like it almost 
gets taken care of by itself because of the synergy that happens when we join our our energy and forces with someone else. Um, a next one in his in his habits is seek first uh, to understand and then to be understood. This one really addresses the whole idea of listening and comprehending, paying attention. A lot of times people listen to um, so that they can talk, not listening to understand. So I love this one. This is probably one of my favorites is seek first to understand and then be understood. Because the truth of it is, is that what people most want uh, much of the time is they want to know that they're being uh, heard, listened to, because that's the way that then someone demonstrates uh, caring. The sixth habit is synergize. And then the, sec the seventh one is this sharpening the saw that's outlined here. And um, it's, it's one of those things where we're always kind of evolving, we're always learning, we're always growing. And hey, every, all of you being on this call today and tuning in and paying attention, this is part of that sharpening the saw for you. You're here, you're learning some new ideas, some not thoughts, and taking the time out um, to pay attention. So let's talk a little bit about belief systems, because belief systems are a really important factor that influences kind of what shows up as far as habits. And, and um, as Don Miguel Ruiz says, you are what you believe you are. He goes on to say that humans are powerful magicians. You have the power to make yourself what you are right now. It's not your reasoning mind that controls your power. It's what you believe. And oftentimes we've sort of been conditioned in our culture with this saying, seeing is believing. But what if you were to try on for just a minute, believing is seeing. That's kind of one of my little, um, um, as I'm moving into this new year of 2019, that's one thing. A friend of mine had said it to me a few weeks ago, and I thought, you know, I'm going to really be paying attention to that um in in the days ahead is believing is seeing um because our thought is creative and the way we think about things really can make a difference and um, a lot of times we develop these belief systems really really early on from infancy forward and oftentimes we have these belief systems that kind of regulate us and regulate our behavior and we're not even uh we're not even aware of what they are so really tuning into that can really be a helpful kind of thing. And then also, um, as we're talking about sort of the physical health uh, and the physical dimension of things, it can, you know, as we just look at some ideas, some strategies, what can be most helpful, some of these things are going to be time tested and things that you already know. And again, that's kind of what we're talking about here is, is sort of the disconnect or the distance that there may be there between what you already know and, and what your practice is, what shows up for you. So some of the time tested are to love and honor your physical body. Um, taking care of it, that means looking at ways to make sure that you're eating healthy foods and eating the right foods for you and the right what's right for you might not be what's right for someone else. We're all different. Our bodies are unique. And so you really, um, uh, it's about tuning into what's good for you, not because there's some diet or some routine that's recommended out there for someone else. Tuning into yourself getting sufficient rest and relaxation. These days, it's really being said seven to nine hours of sleep, making sure you're taking some time out for relaxation, getting that rest and relaxation are both important. Is there a way then to also make sure you're getting some regular exercise? And again, that's whatever it is that's best for you. It could be stretching, it could be yoga. It might just be making a decision to do some, moving your body in some way each, each day. Um, Maintaining a reasonable stress level. You know, a lot of the research now is saying that the number one killer, if not now, it's soon to be, is is stress. Because what happens is that the more stress we're under, um, the more we um, build up all this adrenaline and cortisol in our system. And if the, eventually the immune system has to come in to clean up all that adrenaline and cholesterol. So then it begins to compromise the immune system when it's having to be used in ways that it's not really designed for. So we really need to make sure we're managing our stress. And then laughing, laughing hard, heartily, it's, 
been shown through research that just the act of laughing alone releases the happy hormones and um, can make a, a really big difference um, in the ways that we are able to manage our stress. So as you think about kind of your physical health and your physical body, maybe just take that moment to tune in and think about, you know, what has worked the best for you? And sometimes it doesn't mean you don't have to recreate the wheel. It might mean just being reminded about what really works. And if you've gotten a little off, off of that, you know, what does that mean? How did you do that in the first place and how can you do it again? Okay, moving on here, um, talking a little bit more about the mental and emotional components that we were mentioning a minute ago. Be truthful with yourself. Be honest with yourself. So if you kind of get this internal message about something, this awareness or this insight, tune in, pay attention, listen to that because those messages do come. They don't, they might come while you're in the shower, while you're driving down the road, while you're taking a minute to be quiet. A lot of times it's when we're having a, a mindful moment or taking a moment out from our day-to-day -day routine to just tune in for a minute um, that some of these this information will come to us. It always comes. It's just are we going to set a place for it at the table or are we not? And that's what being truthful with ourselves is all about. So as um, Don Miguel Ruiz says, when you are truthful with yourself, you start to see everything as it is, not the way you want to see it. The wounds in our emotional body are covered by the denial system. When you look at your wounds with the eyes of truth, you can finally heal those wounds. It's kind of like shining a light on, into the dark. Uh, when things are in the dark, we can't see them. When we shine the light on them, then we have a much better view and can be much clearer and see much more clearly what's going on. So the, the truth is there, but sometimes we deny it, or oh, not now, or oh, that's not really true, or oh, I don't want to believe that, or I don't want to see that. And so what happens is we turn away from it. We, we resist it. And I always like to say that which we resist persists. So when we resist, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until we finally pay attention to it. But at that point, when we finally pay attention, maybe there's been some self-destructive things along the way that have really gotten us off track. So the more we can tune in um, and be honest, uh, the better off we are. You see this a lot of times with people with um, kind of addictive kind of behaviors. The denial system is is uh, acting in, alive and well. In fact, I just had somebody I was working with recently that said there's persons experiencing a lot of anxiety, and but they're no longer an addict. And well, it's true. Sometimes when we're we have an addiction that's going on. We're not able to always see because some of what's really behind that's getting covered up. So now the anxiety is showing itself, but now the anxiety can be paid attention to and addressed and, and resolved. Okay, so we've gone through the physical, the mental, emotional, a little bit more about the mental, emotional, the kinds of things that people can find really helpful are reading, journaling, talking, sharing. Um, just kind of doing that inner work that we've been talking about, looking inward. We all have um, kind of what I call the, in, in, in the Jungian perspective, it's the shadow. It's the, the, the kind of the belief systems, the emotions, the thoughts, the things that kind of are hanging out in the background that we're not always aware of them, but they drive our behavior. And so um, the more we kind of I always say it's an inside job. Most of the time when there's difficulties or challenges or we're having a hard time, um, uh, if we can tune into what's, what's in us, what's the inside job part, we have a much better opportunity to, uh, to be clear about what it is that's going on. Okay, so in terms of social health, social is relational and, and um, we all need connections. And I think even at a time uh, like right now, when there's so much communication, that's via technology, being texting, being phone, um, Twitter and Facebook, we're, we're sort of losing some of those, uh, the fabric of our social connections. And, and there's a, a big movement afoot right now, as I see, to really find ways to be bringing people together in groups, in, in avenues like this where we can all come together and, and, 
and and talk. I mean, we're not talking face to face, but so having even those face to face connections is is really important. Um, being generous with our love, and I mean whether that's looking the grocery store clerk clerk in the eye and saying thank you, whether it's um, looking somebody in the eye when they're talking to you and listening attentively and fully. There's lots of ways that we can show up in, in a loving kind of way. And the other piece to that is to just to be authentic in our relationships, to be willing to be vulnerable. The more people can share their vulnerability, um, the more people then feel like they can they can share their vulnerability back. And the more we can be vulnerable with one another, share our our concern, our our joys, our challenges, uh, what we may be struggling with. Um, we can deepen our connections because we know more about each other because of what we've shared. And that's also a very loving way to, to communicate as well. And it's how, again, it's how we develop trust. We share a little bit about of our vulnerability and then we share more and more and more. And as we realize that we can share more and, and be heard, get feedback, have people respond in kind and loving and respectful ways that builds the connection, builds the trust, and it builds the love as well. One last thing here about Ruiz, you are never going to be alone if you are generous with your love. What makes you happy is love coming out of you. And if you are generous with your love, everyone is going to love you. The thing about it is, is if you think about a time when you most connect with that feeling of love, whether it's for a child, a partner, a spouse, uh, a moment in nature, a favored pet of some kind or another, when you just connect so deeply with that in that heart space where the heart just feels kind of warm and like it's bursting kind of wide open, Sometimes it can be helpful to just anchor in and remember what that feeling is, especially at times when you may be feeling disconnected or feeling like you're not paying attention and over uh, and exercising your health as you would like, or times maybe you fall into judgment or shame. I mean, those are such common things in our culture today is, is self-judgment and, and shame. I would say 90%, 95% of all people at one time or another are judging themselves, feeling not good enough, feelings of inadequacy. Most addictions, addictive behaviors are accompanied by shame and guilt. So those are uh, rampant, alive and well, certainly in, in our uh, culture. Uh, so let's talk just a little bit about some ways to connect with your spiritual health. Um, that's really tuning into the real you that we've been talking about, but finding that source of meaning and purpose in your life that inspires you. What inspires you? What makes you come alive? What makes you want to get up in the morning? Uh, what makes you tick? And for some people, it's connecting with nature. Some people, it's connecting, you know, like I said a minute ago, with a favorite animal. Some people, it's a child, it's a spouse, it's a partner. Um, you know, it's of connecting with the awe in life, um, that sometimes which we can't explain, that's sort of beyond um, the, the six senses, it's that those mad moments that we connect with, uh, it's those synergistic moments, those times when um, maybe we're thinking about somebody and then they show up. It's, um, I call them synergistic or also I also call them um, synchronistic, like when you're just thinking about somebody and then they call you. It happens often with my uh, one of my dearest friends. Like I call her and she's like, I was just thinking about you. To me, that's those are those moments when it's like, whoa, what is that? That's pretty powerful. That's kind of magical. Anyway, okay. So as we continue to look at spiritual health, surrender all those ideas about being what you are not and become what you really are. When you surrender to your nature, your true nature, to the truth of who you really are, uh, then we no longer suffer because we're tuned in, we're paying attention, we're living our life in the way that we want to live it instead of the way we should live it, the way we've been programmed and conditioned. This is what somebody says. The beauty of life as we get to a certain stage is we get to decide. You get to decide. 
And and I hear people say, well, it's always been this way. I was taught that it's, I'm supposed to be this way. Well, is that working for you now? Is that a good fit now? Yes, this is what you were taught. Maybe this is what you believe. But is that what's really the truth for you now? That's, again, part of that continuing to just reevaluate. Okay, the next part in our agenda here is to activate. And um, activate is where we take personal responsibility for our life and our health. And um, a lot of times people kind of, I don't, I'm not going to say a lot of times, but a number of times um, people, they kind of feel like they're a victim. They're a victim of their circumstances because this happened to them way back when. This is why I am the way I am now. Um, and then there's sometimes that feeling of I don't, I, there's nothing that I can can do about it. But really, you can take responsibility for your your health and your well-being, and, and that involves being proactive. And and that's sort of the next part of when we we're talking about what the our journey is going to involve today. The next step is being proactive. So when you think about being proactive, sometimes it's helpful to think about when you've been proactive before. What helped you be able to do that? What were the circumstances that were going on for you that created that kind of an opportunity? What was what was your thinking that allowed that? Um, you know, what in you helped you be successful? Because sometimes when we can reflect on times when we were more in alignment with the way we want things to be or what we aspire to, that can be really good information um, uh, moving forward. So it's kind of fun to break down the word responsibility into response ability. You have the ability to respond according to what you value in life. And I really want to highlight this next part because I think this is a key. We maybe have used the word value in the past. We've heard it mentioned. Maybe we talked with, you know, as a child, there was some discussion about values in the home and the family. Um, but what's a key in our lives now is to tune into and pay attention to what do you value most? What is most important? And what's most important for you in taking care of yourself? So for some people, it might be, I really want to nurture my mind. What's most important is I want to take a class. I want to, um, I want to learn something new. I want to um, find a way to manage my racing thoughts and my racing mind, maybe my anxious thoughts that can sometimes create anxiety. Um, maybe it's to move um, um, your body more. And maybe it's to fill the spirit with something that's unlifting, maybe a meditation class or a mindfulness class or a yoga class or um, a church activity or in, uh, a prayer. And so it's you know each, up to each of us to determine what do we value most. And then the second part of that is do my actions match what I say I value most? And if they don't, there's a disconnect. And that's something to take a look at. So then it's time to look at, okay, so if I say I value that, but I'm not doing it, um, do I need to reevaluate what I say my values are? Or how do I want to then maybe reevaluate my behaviors so that I change behaviors that can be more in service to what I value most? So say, for example, somebody tells me I really value good health. I really eva value optimum health and well-being. Meanwhile, they tell me that they've been engaging in misuse of substances. And so then we have to look at, okay, so how is that misuse of substance in service to what you value most, which is optimum physical health and well-being? And so then we can kind of play with it a little bit. It gives some kind of room to move around. All righty. So, um, so maybe just think about that for just a minute. And just take a minute now to think a little, just for a minute about what do you value most? What is most important to you?
And then and as you move forward, um, as we kind of move through the presentation and the days ahead, maybe this is something that you can just be uh, uh, paying attention to for yourself. So with all of this comes new possibilities. So as we become active, as we activate um, uh, these dimensions, as we become proactive, all kinds of new possibilities as arise, can arise. And that's really the exciting part of all this is that life is always full of new options, new possibilities. And it can sometimes be for a lot of people be very exciting and it can be energizing and motivating as well. So change though, as you all know, I'm sure already, is um, uh, activating change can take courage. It can really shake up our routine um, and shake up our usual way of doing things. And it also, we have, uh, over time, we've got people around us conditioned and programmed to respond to us in certain ways based on the way we responded to them. So sometimes we make a change. They're still expecting us to be the way we were before, and now we're different. So that's why I always like to tell people one of the great things about going and talking to a counselor is it provides a really great opportunity. You know, I've started seeing a counselor now and I've been working on some things. And so there's things that I've been doing in the past and I've realized I want to do some things differently. It's a chance to kind of re to do a reset, but it takes a little courage sometimes because it's breaking away from the status quo. And it's also um, a breaking away of old habits and, and, uh, when we're activating change, we have to kind of consider what's, what are some of those um, old habits that are no longer working for us, things that are getting in the way, things that are blocking us from being able to realize those things that we say that we, we value most. Um, and with new ideas, there becomes it's new ideas, new ways of doing things, things that we hadn't thought of before. That's the great thing about the learning process is we are always learning new things. In fact, there's a gentleman by the name of Joe Dispenza. He's written a book called Evolve Your Brain. Basically, he says we our, our brain is like a muscle. We have to exercise it. Two ways that we exercise our brain are by learning new things and novel experiences. In fact, you learn a new foreign language, you go to a foreign country, all those kinds of things. And then, of course, there's mindfulness. Mindfulness is purpose intentionally tuning in and paying attention in the present moment to what's going on without judgment. And that's the key, without judgment, because you get still, as you get silent, you may notice this racing mind and think, oh, what's the matter with me? I can't calm myself down. I'm always overthinking. There's something really the matter with me. That's judgment, okay? And a lot of times the problem is in the judgment, not in, in the overactive mind. And the truth about it is, is we can't stop our mind from thinking. That is just what it does. But what we can do is we can change the way we, we relate to it, which is kind of what, what my next slide is about, is we, we often, because of the conditioning and the programming that we have and the belief systems that we've developed early on, there may be certain that we get triggered by or, or that we get really reactive to. So as you think about the things that are most likely to cause you to feel angry or frustrated or maybe even sad, but think about the times when, you, when you're most reactive. A lot of times we're, we're reacting quickly, stimulus and then immediate response because we've gotten triggered. We all get triggered at different times over different circumstances and situations. It's just different for different people depending on their own particular constitution. So as we take time out, um, uh, like with a meditation practice or a mindfulness practice, anything that helps us with managing our stress and helping us come back to, to, to center and to grounding um, can help us with creating a space between the stimulus and the response, because that's where we have the freedom to make a choice, all right? So we can get triggered, and that's the stimulus, and then we react, boom. And then we maybe say and do things that we regret later because we didn't have that moment in there to make a different choice. So um, when we can institute some practices, tuning in, paying attention, contemplating, 
gives us the opportunity to create, like I say, the distance between the stimulus and response. And that's the one thing that we as human beings have, is we have the ability, and I think we're realizing more and more and more in our Western culture, that this is kind of where we're at, where we're, what we're working on as, as human beings is, is looking at how we respond and choosing ways of responding that are more loving, more caring, more respectful, more in unison with one another. Okay. So, and for different people, there are different things that can help them with creating that space um, where they can choose. Um, uh, so there's choosing according to values, but it's also being able to calm oneself down enough. And mindfulness practices, meditation practices, yoga, journaling, prayer, writing, there are lots of different things that over time, the more one practices it on a regular basis, it begins to kind of happen more automatically um, that you're less reactive when your buttons get pushed because you've developed the muscle, just like the muscles in your body. When you work those muscles, they get stronger. So when you work your um, reaction muscle, then uh, gives you a chance to really practice it. All right, moving on to the next thing. Taking a look at the language and the way we communicate and the way we express ourselves and the messages, because every time we make a statement, um, we're reinforcing it in our own brain. So notice the difference between I choose to exercise um, and I don't have time to exercise. So if you're saying over and over and over and over again, I don't have time to exercise, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say, I choose to exercise today, I choose to exercise, I choose to exercise, I choose to exercise, pretty soon that could become a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. Um, you know, other ones, I'm aware of my reactions to stress. I am aware. I want to eat healthfully. I can ask for help. It's a much... Um, more kind of proactive languaging and and my point here more than anything is being aware of the languaging that we use both for ourselves and in the way we reference other people as well. It can make a huge difference. So just thinking about the, just paying attention to the way you use language. When you describe yourself, do you describe yourself in sort of put down kinds of ways or in more uplifting kinds of ways. So as you can see from the from this discussion, I know it's sort of a one-sided one so far. Um, there's there are a lot of different things that affect us and and affect the, that provide a place where we can intervene. Um, so it, it can be in any one of a number of places. It can be in your spiritual dimension, your physical, your mental, your emotional, your relational, just your own relationship with yourself, how you think about things, your belief systems, how much attention and awareness you bring to it, the language that you use. Those are all different places where, where we, can, we can take a step toward a, a new way of doing things. There's no one that's better or worse than the other. They're all different. The key is is taking some action step. So a first step toward that might be focus, focusing your attitude, you know, paying attention, what, you know, tuning it, what is my attitude? Um, do I have a victim mentality? Do I have a, um, I can do it kind of a mentality and attitude. And if you don't right now, because you're feeling discouraged or you're having a rough time, that's understandable. That's the beauty of the EAP because the EAP can certainly, um, have a, a number of resources to support you with that. Um, another one is your perception, is how are you perceiving things? Two people can see the same thing going on and perceive it in totally different ways. Tuning into your perception, tuning into your emotions and how they're affecting your present behavior. We've been talking about that all along. I'm not going to elaborate on it now. And um, it's focusing on the things that are within your control. And we're going to be talking more about that as we go through these next few slides, too. So when it comes to our habits, there's our knowledge. There's what to do and why to do it. And, and so it's the knowledge that we have about it. Then it comes to our skill. Um, 
how to do it. Do we know how to do it? And then there's the desire. There's the want to. So they're all, they can all be affected by motivation. You know, what is it that motivates us the most? And, and as, you, as you look at a habit form, uh, habit form is something that generally starts um, at some point in time and then it gets reinforced over and over and over and over and over again. And so pretty soon we lay down neurological pathways in our brain that correspond to that habit pattern. So uh, the, the only thing that we have to do, I wouldn't say the only thing I make it sound so simple, but really on some level it is. Uh, altering a habit form is where in the moment of that habit where we make a different choice. And the more we make a different choice in the moment, instead of engaging in the habit form, we break the habit pattern that's neurologically been laid down. Because as soon as we're no longer reinforcing it, then it creates the opportunity for new patterns to be developed and the, other, and the old pattern, the old habit pattern, to extinguish itself. We tend to live in Western culture that says we have to use willpower and we have to stop doing something. In fact, sometimes willpower isn't the answer to something like this. Sometimes it's taking a different action step. Uh, and and focusing on again values. What's most important? What is it that I really want? And and that way, instead of trying to white knuckle it and willpower it, your focus isn't on on how you're being restrained and held back and how you're not being able to do what you want to do, even though you want to do it. Your your more your your energy is more engaged and motivated on this action, different action step that you're taking. So the next slide is just going to give you some um, an example of of habits. Okay, so like for example, here's 15 habits, things that maybe um, you might want to engage in for yourself. So this is just an example um, for you of you know, and it's kind of a suggestion. So as you're starting to think about your habit patterns, um, maybe it's looking at um, what are, what are 15 habits um, that you can identify with? Making a list for yourself. And, it's gonna, and sometimes your 15 habits might be based on um, your values. What's most important? What are the things that you um, value as being the most important? For some people, um, they're going to most highly value, say, for example, connections, relationships and connecting with others. Some, another person, that, that may not be their priority. Maybe they're more of an, an introvert. They get their juice by being, um, their energy and their energy charge from being more alone and at home and tuning in and in ways that are more kind of introspective or reflective. Um, somebody else, for example, may their highest um, priority um, value might be getting daily exercise. For some people, it might mean, you know, working uh, uh, no more than X number of uh, hours a day and putting that as their highest value. So um, values and habits kind of go hand in hand, really, um, as you kind of identify it. So then the next um, step or strategy in the process then is to, as you kind of outline what some habits are, to kind of look at them and pick the ones um, that are most important habits for your particular um, wellness plan. So maybe start with something small, because a lot of times what happens when people want to make a behavioral change or a change of any kind is they try to do too much too soon, and then they get discouraged and give up along the way. So the strategy isn't about trying to take on too much, too soon, or something really big. The key, the absolute key in, in, in habit patterning is, is in the action step itself. Because as you take one action step, that helps build momentum. Because isn't that always sort of the million dollar question is I just don't seem to be very motivated. I want this, but my motivation doesn't seem to match what it is that I want. And so sometimes it's because we haven't got the motivation. We don't have the energy behind it. And, and so when we take an action step, that, um, okay. So one of the things is, um, 
is this whole idea of locus locus of control. Basically, locus of control is based on the it's the degree to which people believe they have control over the outcome of events in their lives, um, as opposed to external forces beyond their control. A lot of times, when people feel like um, they don't have control over their lives, they feel like they're a victim. So the truth about it is, is that you do have the opportunity to um, control the events in your lives as you decide kind of what's most important. So if you move into the next slide, um, one of the things is you're looking at habits and <clears throat> kind of <clears throat> determine what's most important. Looking at um, deciding, and there's a, a little chart that I'm going to show you next where you decide, okay, what are my top three habits, what's most important, and choosing habits that are um, uh, important and um, and you get to decide that. Like I said earlier, nobody else gets to decide that for you. So this next, the next page is going to give you a chart that I want you to see that gives you a little better idea of kind of how to organize um, your thoughts around this. So this little chart, this is kind of a locus of control chart. So you look at what are the activities that are important and urgent and um, you could kind of fill these boxes yourself. So what's important and urgent, what's important, not urgent, what's not important and urgent, what's not urgent and not important. That kind of helps you decide what's most important. And so you're going to want to be choosing things that are, um, that are important rather than urgent in terms of kind of your overall um, um, if you'll see over here, important and not urgent prevention, values, clarification. Okay. So moving along here. So let's think about maybe a homework assignment. Um, if you were going to think uh, in this next slide about um, being proactive, and if you're going to be proactive, um, what's that going to look like for you? So maybe that could mean just picking um, one dimension of um, that uh, uh, most important to you and and think about what that might be and then it's going to be a matter of practicing 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 as we were talking about earlier the more we practice the better off we get and sometimes it is just um, uh, being proactive and, and taking that one little step that we were talking about a little bit earlier. And um, the next one is to remain teachable, remembering that there's always um, something that you can be learning along the way. And um, we're, we're never too old and we're never too young to always be engaged and embracing kind of the new things that are coming our way. All righty, so next step and the next slide um, is um, kind of a review of all that. So being proactive daily, um, picking one dimension that has tugged it and, um, and think about what that might be. What's one small step that you might want to take? And even if it seems really, really small, like for example, I knew somebody that wanted to start an exercise plan. And I said, well, what have you been doing so far? Well, nothing. So um, as it turned out, that person's first step was to just go out and buy some good exercise shoes. Again, that's an action step that's putting energy toward it. It's taking a step in a new direction. And that's where the energy and the momentum um, begins to build. Practice, 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 again, and remain teachable. So the very last slide basically is just kind of a commitment to yourself. Um, it's asking you um, what your plan is going to be. So basically it's creating a plan. So what's your plan to exercise your health? What do you want to, what do you want to stop doing? Or what do you want to start doing? Or what do you want to keep doing? And, um, I actually um, like to focus more on 
what do you want to start doing or keep doing as opposed to the stopping, particularly if the stopping is around kind of a habit form that um, you've been trying to change over time. Because if you haven't been successful with stopping it, maybe it means it's time to start doing something different. In uh, I, I do appreciate seeing somebody wrote in saying this is timely with um, New Year's resolutions. And you know, it's kind. Of, I kind of think of it along the way as like New Year's resolutions. It's a time to kind of reevaluate. Sometimes New Year's resolutions has kind of a negative connotation because of all the times that people have made them and then had difficulty with being successful. So I think of it sometimes as setting an intention, or kind of like our presentation here, creating a plan, setting an intention for what we um, most would most uh, like in our lives, get down to the values piece we were talking about. What's most important? And then that can sometimes, again, guide um, whether it's our New Year's resolutions or our intentions moving forward. And kind of a final reminder that I just really want to put out there to everybody is that, that the key is in the action step is in taking an action step because that's what builds momentum, it's what builds motivation, it's what builds energy. And no action step is too small. Just the action step in and of itself is what creates the difference and can create the shift. So take pressure off yourself if there is any or any judgment or, or demand and, and start with something that's small, doable, and manageable. Kind of like um, a lot of times I know in the workplace we talk about smart goals, small, manageable, achievable, recognizable, or you know, yeah, recognizable and um, time limited. Rel no, no, rely, see, smart, <laughs> manageable, achievable, um, realistic, realistic is the R and T, time limited. So, uh, and so maybe you can be thinking about that a little bit. Is this a, is this a small enough goal? Um, is it smart? Is it um, is it something that is based on what's most important to you now? Okay, is it manageable? Are you trying to do too much? If you're somebody that's wanting to start exercising, are you expecting yourself to run a mile the first time you put your shoes on and walk outside? Um, is it achievable? Is it something that's um, that you is doable and it's something that you can achieve. It's realistic. They're all kind of along that same line and time limited. Sometimes it's helpful to have kind of a time limit to it over the next three months or over the X amount of time and hang in there with it. And certainly if you have any questions, uh, feel free to give a call to our toll-free number. That's the 866 uh, 750-1327. If there's anything I can answer, I'm Brenda, Brenda H. And um, I just want to wish you all the very best uh, as you move forward in taking these new steps and um, kind of letting your spirit shine and soar in the, the days ahead. Thanks for taking the time out, being here, and for taking care of you. Bye-bye.